They say that, to be evil, one must be profoundly immoral and wicked. If that's the technical definition, then I'm sure you will agree that Cassandra Bjorg takes the crown as an evil teenager. Without giving too much away just yet, Cassandra was a terrible teen who wouldn't take no for an answer. And after being shipped off to live with her grandparents, she would repay their generosity and patience in the most disgusting of ways. So, what made Cassandra so rotten to the core? How would her family deal with her terrible behaviour, and what were the consequences? Hey there folks, my name is Adrian, this is Coffee House Crime, and it's great to see you again. Today, we're looking at the case of Cassandra Bjork. By the way, I post up to four times a week here, two long form and two short videos, so if that's of interest to you, please consider subscribing. And now, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Cassandra Bjork. Welcome to the state of Georgia, folks. Now, there is a lot to like about the Peach State. It is well known for its warm climate, Coca-Cola, and its three Ps. That being peanuts, pecans, and peaches. It makes you wonder, why is it known as the Peach State and not the Pecan State, or the Peanut State, or the Coca-Cola State? Interesting fact, but I almost moved to Georgia as a teenager. My dad was offered a job in Atlanta, but turned it down to stay in Oxford. I'm trying to imagine how different things would be if I moved there. I mean, coffeehouse crime wouldn't exist for a start. Maybe I'd have launched peach house crime instead. Anyway, Georgia. The agriculture, mining, and manufacturing industries dominate this state. Logistics, film, and entertainment are also major players here, and tech is on the rise too. Regarding crime rate, the peachy peach state is right in the middle of the pack. Violent crime rate is actually 12% lower than national average here, whereas property crime rate is about 17% higher. But anyway, two of those living in the state of Georgia, in a small city named Lawrenceville, were Wendy and Randall Bjorg. With a population of 31 1,000 people, Lawrenceville is found on the northeastern border of Atlanta. It seems like a nice place, to be honest. If you're in the area, I've heard that Boulder Creek Coffee does amazing pour-overs. Not affiliated, by the way, just something a local has told me. Wendy and Randall Bjorg were the perfect elderly couple. They had a loving family, and were well-respected in their local community of Lawrenceville. Being married for multiple decades, the 63-year-olds were the perfect picture of husband and wife. Described as friendly yet quiet, they were easy to live next to, were known to help with yard work through the local neighbourhood, and volunteered at local community centres. That is why when their daughter, Amanda, called for help with her troubled teenage daughter, it only seemed natural for them to step in and guide her. Because, being blunt, she clearly needed it. What they didn't know, however, was that by accepting young Cassandra Bjorg into their household, their lives would change forever. Cassandra, called Cassie for short, was born and raised in Duluth, Georgia. She lived with her mother, Amanda Sterling, and her stepfather. And although Cassandra's early life isn't well known, locals say that her childhood was, unfortunately, messy and tumultuous. Without a suitable father figure to guide her, Cassandra was a wild child with little to no manners. She lacked direction from either of her parents, and was essentially left alone to do whatever she wanted, whenever she wanted. By the time she was 16 years old, Old, this resulted in a terrible relationship with law enforcement, with many offences including underage drinking, smoking weed, shoplifting, domestic assault, skipping school, and running away from home. She quickly got involved with the so-called wrong crowd, and when her mother finally had enough with her bratty behaviour, it was unfortunately too late to change anything. The teenage girl had developed a selfish attitude of my way or the highway. With her daughter so out of control, Amanda desperately needed help, and so she called her own parents to see if they could do anything to support her. Amanda thought that if she could get her daughter away from all of the drama at home and school, then maybe she could have a fresh start and turn her life around. And so, in the year 2016, Wendy and Randall filed for custody of Cassie. As a result, she moved from Duluth to join her grandparents in Lawrenceville. But Cassie made it immediately clear that she was not happy with this arrangement. She was angry, unresponsive, and quite rude to her grandparents' demands and immediately challenged their authority. As a result, tension began to grow, but you see, Cassie's grandparents believed that, deep down, she was not a bad person. She had merely been raised in an unhealthy environment. Trying to get through to their granddaughter, they outlined their rather basic expectations. No staying out late, no smoking or drinking, 
attend school every day, and homework must be completed on time. The bare essentials, really. I mean, I'd be laughing if I had this as a child. But of course, Cassie had no intention of changing her lifestyle or attitude. She was already used to living with her mother, where she could practically get away with almost anything without repercussions. At first, Wendy and Randall kept their peace and remained quite patient with her, trying to understand that it may take some time before she settles down. What they may have underestimated, however, was Cassie's bullheadedness and willingness to get her way by any means necessary. Once it became clear that neither party would bend the knee to each other, the shy tension turned into absolute warfare. And despite her initial enrollment at the local high school named Peach Tree Ridge, her attendance would not last for long. The young Miss Bjorg dropped out and refused to go to class. And without school to ground her, she began to cause more mischief in the new area of Lawrenceville. According to police records, local law enforcement had to respond to the Bjorg home 31 times from 2016 through to 2017. Nine of those calls were from neighbours who often heard shouting and banging from the household. And 18 calls were made directly from Wendy and Randall, who constantly experienced their granddaughter running away. Some of those calls involved domestic disputes, where Cassie became physically violent against her grandparents. Others included drinking or smoking illegally in the household, and these altercations with the law would unfortunately escalate in severity. In the winter of 2016, Officers arrived at the Bjorg household when Cassie's grandparents called to report that she had physically assaulted Wendy. According to official reports, Wendy told the officers that she and Cassie were arguing after she had been caught drinking again. After being told to watch her language, Cassie grabbed a glass full of water and threw it at her grandmother, narrowly missing her as it smashed into pieces against the wall behind her. Her actions were seriously concerning. This outburst was uncalled for and she could have severely injured her grandmother by doing so. When the responding officer spoke to the two, it became quite clear that Cassie didn't give a shit. While Wendy tried to explain the situation as calmly as possible, Cassie continuously interrupted. She simultaneously insulted her and the other officers, and was generally just being rude. While nothing legally came of this incident, Cassie's lousy behaviour was obviously taking a toll on her grandparents. I mean, put yourself in their shoes for just a moment. Here, they were trying to guide their granddaughter with as much love and support as possible, but all they received back instead was pure rudeness and aggression. Cassie's utter disdain for any authority made it exceedingly difficult for Wendy and Randall to coexist with her. Now, I haven't seen any reference to this in any court documents or police reports, and it is just an opinion of mine as an armchair psychologist. But with so much hatred towards authority, and her actions which eventually followed, I do wonder if she suffered from oppositional defiant disorder. As mentioned before, she was notorious for running away from home, and it wasn't uncommon for her to sneak out at night and be gone for multiple days at a time. Whenever she disappeared, Wendy would often take to Facebook asking for help and to create missing posters to spread the word. April the 1st, 2017 was unfortunately no different. Once again, Cassie decided to put her grandparents through a lot of emotional turmoil, and once again, Wendy went to Facebook desperate for help. But unknown to her and everyone else at the time, this would actually be the last time she would ever post to Facebook, because a mere few hours later, she fell silent. At 11.18pm, her last text message read, I'm going to bed soon, maybe tomorrow will be better. All I can do is hope for the best and expect the worst it shouldn't be this hard for any of us. This message held a terribly large amount of dark irony, because after it was sent, no one would ever hear from her again, which was very unusual because she always kept people up to date. As the days passed, peripheral members of the family began to grow worried. You see, Wendy and Randall were not replying to any of their messages or phone calls, and so a welfare check was requested. When officers arrived at the house, they instantly sensed that something was amiss. Despite knocking on the door several times, no one answered it. Now, officers decided to wait an extra day before any intervention, but when they did return the following day, they received no answer at the door. 
On April the 8th, a seemingly unrelated call came over the radio. Nearby, in the town of Lawrenceville, a domestic assault was reported from one of the homes in the area. However, by the time responding officers arrived, the attackers had already fled the scene. But those assailants were identified immediately, and perhaps unsurprisingly, that included Cassandra Bjorg and her 19-year-old boyfriend, Johnny Ryder. They had unlawfully entered the home of Johnny's sister and her boyfriend, and sadly, their crimes would not stop there. Johnny's sister and her boyfriend returned home earlier that evening to find their house in complete disarray. The bedroom was torn to pieces, with several items missing and furniture damaged beyond repair. And standing in the middle of the bedroom, smirking, was Cassie Bjorg and her boyfriend, Johnny. An altercation broke out between the two couples, with Johnny Pepper spraying his sister in the face, sending her to her knees. He then began to beat her boyfriend in the face, while Cassie went to grab a baseball bat. She followed up by beating Johnny's sister over the head, neck, and shoulders, leaving both of them fighting for their lives on the ground. Cassie and Johnny then fled the scene, taking his sister's car in the process. Both victims sustained severe injuries from the attack, and after speaking to the police, were escorted to the hospital immediately. In the meantime, detectives started looking into the crime scene. While there, they realized that the car that Johnny and Cassie had arrived in was not actually theirs. In fact, it belonged to Wendy and Randall, who had been missing for several days. When they returned to the Bjorg residence, officers were much more forceful in trying to get an answer this time. But after failing to establish a connection, they decided to barge the door down. That is when an overwhelming stench of decay greeted them. Making their way upstairs to the master bedroom, that terrible smell grew stronger, and after opening that bedroom door, they found Wendy and Randall dead on the floor. Both had succumbed to a very violent death. The elderly couple had stab wounds all across their bodies, and they were both victims of blunt force trauma to the head. Suddenly, their silence now made sense to officers. To all those times they had knocked on that front door, Wendy and Randall were inside all along murdered in cold blood. The discovery completely shocked the community of Lawrenceville, and neighbours could not believe that the lovely couple they had come to know were now dead. As expected, Johnny and Cassie immediately became their primary suspects. With Wendy and Randall dead, and their car found at Johnny's sister's house, these two connected the dots perfectly. Thankfully, with an entire task force dedicated to the case, the team did not take long to track them down. In fact, the very next morning, they found them in an apartment complex nearby. The two had barricaded themselves inside a friend's apartment and, as you could imagine, they were not going to give themselves up easily. Police surrounded the premises, and, using a loudspeaker, ordered them to exit the apartment with their hands in the air. Of course, Johnny and Cassie refused, and in a standoff that lasted for over an hour, police negotiated to no avail. To scope the area and gain intel, officers used a small remote-controlled robot to enter the property. That was when the police realized that the two teens were actually boarded up in the bathroom, and after gaining entry, officers realized that the two were lying in a pool of their own blood. Rather than face justice for their awful crimes, they decided to end their lives together by cutting their wrists with a razor blade. Thankfully though, they were unsuccessful in their own little scheme and police managed to barge in, apprehend, and get them medical treatment afterwards. Police found the couple in the house after relatives asked for a welfare check. Officers checked the home earlier in the week, but they were unable to make contact. They returned to the house overnight after finding the couple's car on Rambling Woods Drive. That's where the two relatives of the granddaughter's boyfriend reported he beat them with a baseball bat. Police then searched hours for the teens, and this morning, they received a call the two were at the residence at McGinnis Ferry in Swanee. Investigators say the two barricaded themselves inside an apartment, sparking a SWAT standoff. Police say once they made entry, they found the teens with self-inflicted stab wounds. We spoke with the victim's neighbors here in Lawrenceville. They are shocked by the turn of events. Now in custody, and after being treated to their wounds, it actually took very little time for the two teenage lovers to turn on each other. I've said this many times before, and I'll say it again. Murderous couples almost 
always end up blaming each other. Each claimed that the other was the one to murder Wendy and Randall while they helplessly watched on. But while under interrogation, Cassie would be the first one to break her story, eventually revealing what actually happened on the night that her grandparents were murdered. And so, the story goes like this. Cassie was sick of her grandparents trying to control her life. She had had enough of their discipline, and so, after running away on the 1st of April, she met with Johnny to hatch a sinister plot to murder them. They designed their method of attack, and further theorised on how to dispose of their bodies. Later that night, Johnny and Cassie parked outside of the Bjorg residence and waited for the lights to turn off. And once the house was covered in darkness, they covertly entered. Oblivious to their impending tragedy, Wendy and Randall were upstairs, occupied with concern for their missing granddaughter. They loved her dearly, and although she was missing, they hoped that she was okay. Meanwhile, armed with a fire iron, hammer, baseball bat, butcher knives, and duct tape, Johnny and Cassie stealthily crept up the staircase, positioning themselves just outside of the bedroom door. They listened to hear if they were asleep, and once things got quiet, that is when they entered. Johnny initiated the assault, catching the elderly couple off guard. He mercilessly attacked Randall, while Cassie, fueled by a surge of energy, rushed to Wendy's side, also attacking her in the process. Dragging her grandmother from the bed, she duct taped her before pulling her into the bathroom. She then stabbed her several times across her body. Within seconds, two lives were senselessly cut short. Following their deaths, Johnny and Cassie callously arranged their lifeless bodies on the bedroom floor. After that, they sealed the windows and doors with cork, desperate to contain the inevitable smell of decomposition. In a display of monstrous indifference, they then cleaned themselves up and went downstairs to relax after the brutal murders. They ordered takeout and merrily talked about their actions. And just a couple hours later, they threw a drug fueled house party while Cassie's grandparents lay dead upstairs. Johnny and Cassie remained on the property for multiple days after this, only leaving to attack Johnny's sister, who was only the second of several planned victims. It took several days for law enforcement to discover Wendy and Randall. In in fact, it took forensic cleanup teams many hours to eventually scrub the scene clean. Now that our two murderous teens were in custody and had turned on each other, it became unmistakably clear that they were responsible. What's worse, Cassie also admitted that the two had planned to murder Johnny's entire family before then setting their sights on Amanda too. In fact, they were so close to the next part of their plan that they'd even reached Johnny's parents' house but then he changed his mind when he didn't recognize two cars on the driveway. Detectives described this case to be highly unique and disturbing. I mean, the town of Lawrenceville had never seen such a sadistic killer before, and a small teenage girl of all people. This story gripped the state of Georgia for all of the wrong reasons, and many people wanted to see them hang but some were sympathetic due to their age. Being over the age of 18, Johnny was likely to receive the death penalty if the case had gone to trial. But fortunately for him, since both of them had struck a plea deal, this was now off of the table. After pleading guilty to the murders of Wendy and Randall Bjork, and guilty to aggravated assault and theft, our lovebirds were sentenced to life in prison, with the possibility of parole only after 60 years. In addition to this, they were sentenced to an extra 21 years to be served concurrently with their life sentences. The judge presiding over this case said, I'm not sure if I've ever imagined such a well-planned, despicable, heinous act to be committed by two such young people. The heartless and depraved nature of what the two of you did tells me it is not worth my time. When given a chance to speak, Johnny seemed seemed to be genuinely remorseful, and asked for forgiveness from his family and the community. He claimed that the crime was horrific and evil, and said that, in his heart, he knew that he deserved hellfire. On the other hand, Cassie was silent when offered the chance to speak, and opted to cry quietly instead. Whether she was crying over the death of her grandparents, or the death of her own life, we may never know. But due to the callous and brutal nature of her actions, I'm going to bet on the latter. Cassie's mother later said that she could not believe what had happened, and never knew that her daughter was capable of doing something so evil. The case ended with an elderly couple's lives cut short, a community reeling from their murders, and two young adults left to rot in prison for the next many decades to come. Wendy and Randall Bjorg were upstanding members of Lawrenceville, 
But in the end, what mattered was not how well they treated others, but rather how others treated them. By trying to help their daughter and their granddaughter, they paid the ultimate price for trying to be good people. Sadly, this case is the ultimate example of what can happen when a callous brat derails. It's quite unique to see a killer so young, especially when it involves familicide. I mean, there are entire YouTube channels dedicated to this type of killer alone. So yeah, this one's quite messed up. Anyway folks, I think that pretty much wraps up this case today, but before you go, I really want to know what you think about this one. For one, do you think that Cassandra's mother, Amanda, has any part to blame in this? I mean, she was unable to control her daughter from a very young age, so does that mean she's partially responsible? Or do you think that Cassie was just a rotten egg, destined to become a senseless murderer? Personally, I'm more leaning towards the latter, but I'd like to know what you think. I'll let you come to your own conclusion, because I do genuinely appreciate the diversity in both opinions and thoughts. And that's it. Thank you so much for watching, folks. I really do appreciate you making it this far in the video. By the way, if you have Instagram and want to be part of this community, then please follow me over there too. I do all sorts like giveaways and Q&As, reels and videos, stories, and many, many more things and there's many photos of Nero. Thank you again for watching, folks, and as always, I'll see you again very soon for another video. Until that moment arrives, though, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Happy holidays. Goodbye.